Okay, if, if, if y'all are all right with it, let's start just a couple of minutes early, please, because I have a lot of material to go through tonight. This particular study that I'm going to uh, talk with you about is one that I led through a, a Zoom um, study uh, with some brethren in Tennessee a few months ago. So I had about 20 pages of notes uh, on this particular lesson, so I had to trim that down quite a bit. Uh, to get this into 35 minutes. So I'm not going to be able to go through with everything that I that I could say about this particular uh, topic. So I'm going to trim it down uh, due to the limited amount of time that we have. But this is a big subject and I want to go ahead and jump right into it if you're OK with that. I'm glad to see you tonight. Uh, I hope you have a good holiday week. Hope you have uh, time with your family and God bless you and God bless your family as we get ready to head into the new year. Take out your Bibles, please. Go to John chapter 2. When you go in your Bible to John chapter 2, due to the, uh, the uh, just huge amount of information I have tonight, I'm going to have to really ask your permission to limit comments tonight because this is a, this is a big lesson here. Uh, this is John 2. This is the first lesson in the second half of your workbook. Uh, on, on, in your workbook, the first part was the last week of Christ. We just finished that. The second part uh, is the miracles of Jesus. We're starting that tonight. Um, I gave a lesson Sunday that was designed to set up this series we're going to be engaged in over the next few weeks. Uh, it was a sermon that gave some background information about the miracles of Jesus, what they were all about, why he did them. You, if you missed that lesson, I, I recommend that you go to our website and check that out because I'm not going to deal with that tonight. Tonight, I'm going to dive right into the first specific miracle of Jesus that we're going to study in this series. And that is the miracle when Jesus turned water into wine. We're going to look at the, the miracle that really jump started the ministry of Jesus. So let's bow our heads and pray. Then we're going to jump into it. Almighty God. Thank you so much, Father, for uh, this place, uh, this, this building we have to come together in safety and security and comfort to be able to study your word. Our Father, we're so, so thankful for the gospel record. We're thankful for the information you've given us to study about the miracles of your son and how those miracles confirm that he is who he claimed to be. He is the son of God. We pray that you will bless our study uh, tonight, we pray for our young people, all the Bible class teachers. We always are mindful of our shepherds and the, and the difficult work they have. We pray that you will bless them, bless their families, bless our deacons, bless every member of this good church, Father. We pray for those, Father, who are sick and unable to be out tonight, that you will be with them and those grieving and needing and in need of special comfort at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So this right here, as I said, is the first miracle Jesus performs that we can read about as far as in a public way. This miracle actually will jumpstart his three-year ministry. There are five things that I really want to talk about in this particular lesson. I want to talk about the context, the context of this miracle. I want to look at Mary's role in all of this. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned in this account. I want to talk about the miracle itself, what it shows, and I want to talk about why Jesus picked this particular miracle to manifest himself to Israel. And then I want to talk about some things that we can learn about Jesus from this miracle. Now, I think it's good that we just read the text first. I think we need to read what the Bible says uh, about this particular miracle. John 2, verse 1. John 2, 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard Translation. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots 
set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. Then he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Okay, let's begin by talking about the context of this particular parable. The beginning of the text says three days later. Three days later. Three days later from what? From what? Remember, the Bible doesn't have chapter breaks when it's originally written. Three days later from the events that end chapter 1. So if you were a Jew... Reading this in the first century, you're reading this straight through on one scroll. This is not no chapter breaks. So this would have made more sense to them. They would have seen this more clearly. This is three days after his encounter with Nathaniel. Remember what happened with Nathaniel? Remember Jesus goes to Nathaniel and he converts Nathaniel. He converts Nathaniel because what does he do? He tells him something intimate about himself that he could not have known unless he was a man who has supernatural power. Remember he said, Nathaniel, before I even came here, I already saw you. Where did I see you? He was under the fig tree. And, and he says, I see you're a man with no deceit in your heart. Now that was something that really convicted Nathaniel because he says to him in verse number 49 of chapter 1, you are the son of God. <laughs> The king of Israel, he was converted by the fact that Jesus says, I saw you even before we personally met. I know exactly where you were doing. I know exactly where you were at. That converted Nathaniel. He was impressed by that. But Jesus said to him in verse 50, because I say to you that you saw, I saw you on the fig tree, you believe you're going to see greater things than these. This is nothing compared to what you're going to see moving forward. That statement needs to be connected to the next chapter because Jesus, Jesus is going to fulfill that promise right away. Where is Nathaniel from? Well, when you look at what the Bible says in John 21 and verse 2, Nathaniel was one of the seven fishermen that Jesus manifested himself to after being raised from the dead in John 21 and verse 2. The Bible says there that Nathaniel was from where? He's from Cana of Galilee. Where does Jesus perform this miracle? Cana of Galilee. He's going he's to fulfill this promise to Nathaniel very, very soon. Three days after he meets, he meets Nathaniel, he attends a wedding. This wedding is in Cana of Galilee. Ironically, Nathaniel's from Cana of Galilee. Now, let's say some things about weddings among the Jews in ancient times. In our time today, weddings are a pretty big deal, right? They're a big deal. Uh, maybe you had a big, lavish wedding. Janice and I didn't get to have one of those. We wouldn't pay $40 to adjust to the piece. But we got papers just like you got papers. Uh, but uh, but uh, weddings are a big deal in our culture. They're a big deal. But they were even a bigger deal among the Jews in ancient times. They were just a, a tremendous deal. I don't know if you've noticed in your study of the Bible, but the Bible mentions weddings quite often. It, they're mentioned quite often in teachings and parables. Uh, they are often associated in the Bible with feasting, with celebration, particularly in the writings of the prophets. Many of Jesus' parables talk about weddings. Have you noticed that? Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. That, that's, a wedding is, is, is mentioned there. A wedding is at the core of that teaching. Luke chapter 14, the parable of the guests. That's another parable that has to do with, with a wedding. Jesus often made references to weddings in his teachings. 
These were big deals among the Jewish people. Now, in our time, how long does a wedding usually last? Three hours. <laughs> and that's still a long wedding, ain't it? <laughs> they, they don't, they don't, they not pass a few hours, right? In the Jews, in the time of the Jews, they would last, the celebration of a wedding could go a week. Sometimes it could go up to two weeks. They were long events. They were, they were not just a few hours. Sometimes they would go a week. Sometimes they would go to, to two weeks. They were big, long events celebrations and understanding that can help us make sense of this problem that pops up in John 2. There's a problem that happens at this wedding. Now I want to make a few important observations about what we read here in John 2. Let's talk about this family that hosts this wedding. The family that hosts this wedding, I think there's some things we can conclude about them uh, pretty, pretty clearly. One, this is probably a very wealthy family. This is a wealthy family. How do we know that? Well, notice there's servants at the wedding. You see that? There's a head waiter at the wedding. They got these massive stone jars. Those were very expensive in ancient times. The average Jewish family did not have these massive kind of stone jars, these massive water pots. This is clearly a wealthy family. Jesus has a connection to this family. What connection did he have exactly? Well, the scripture doesn't tell us. We see his mama's there, right? We see he's there with his disciples. Evidently, he's been invited to this wedding. Maybe it's through his connection with Nathaniel, because Nathaniel's from Cana of Galilee. It's not clear, but we do know he's got connections to this family in some way. He and his disciples have been invited to this wedding. This is also a very religious family. We know that because of the water pots. Why did they have these massive water pots? Well, most Jews in ancient times had these massive water pots, which were typically, typically called mikvahs. If you watched my uh, Jesus Walks videos, I mentioned mikvahs in those, in those videos. Mikvahs were big containers that Jewish people would wash in for purification reasons. They would wash in them for many different reasons. Sometimes they would use them uh, to wash before attending and being part of weddings. Uh, they were also used them whenever they uh, came into contact with Gentiles, with Samaritans. Uh, if a Jewish person would even touch the same object that a Samaritan happened to touch, they would go through this ceremonial cleansing, this ceremonial washing, and they typically would do those in these big containers, these stone jars, these mikvahs. And so this is a religious family. They have these big water pots, these big stone jars. There's an indication there that they are involved in purifications. Now, a few other things I want to say is this miracle, and the text makes that very clear towards the end in verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11, happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is the beginning of it. Jesus is about 30 years old. He has not yet really started his ministry yet. Uh, so this is very early. He's about 30 years old, but this is going to jumpstart everything. Okay? And another thing to make mention of is this is one of the few times in the Gospels where we find Jesus actually interacting with his mother. Okay? Now, usually when we think about Mary, especially around this time of the year, we think of the virgin birth story. We tie her to that always, right? That, that God selected her as a young girl to bring his son into the world. That's typically where Mary is limited to as far as the gospel goes in our discussions of it. But this is one of the other occasions in the gospel where Mary is mentioned. She is actually recorded as interacting with her son. They talk. They hold a conversation. We don't see that too often in the Gospels. So that's something that, that's important to appreciate. Now, let's get down to some other things here. Let's talk about the problem at this wedding. What was the problem? What, what happened at this wedding that became a problem? They ran out of wine. They ran out of wine. Verse 3 says that. John 2, 3. They say that we have no wine. They have no wine. Why would this be a problem? What's the big deal? We ran out of wine. What's the, what's the big deal about that? Part of the hospitality of the wedding. 
Yes. Okay, so this right here would have been a big problem, a problem that's kind of hard for us to grasp a little bit. Because when we, somebody hosts us and the person runs out of refreshments, you know, we probably won't make such a, a big deal about that. But at this time, and you have maybe a week-long feast taking place, and you've, you have this limited guest list because when Jews invited people to their weddings, they didn't, just, they didn't just invite any and everybody under the sun. They had a very limited guest list, okay? They were very selective in the people they invited to their weddings. And so when the people came, it was all on the host. The hosts were, were, were brought out and provided, provided everything. And this would have been a social disgrace among the Jewish people. To have this guest list, to be inviting these people, and you run out of one of the main refreshments, this would have been something that would have stained this family probably forever. It would have been a social disgrace. It would have been the talk of the town that they invited us here, and they don't even have enough refreshments. They ran out of refreshments. They ran out of wine. This is a big problem. It's such a big problem that somebody comes to Jesus and makes him aware of the problem. Who came to Jesus and made him aware of this? Mary did. Is she called Mary in the text? Is Mary's name specifically mentioned in the text? Okay, that's all it says. Does it say her name, though? No. John never mentions Mary's name in his gospel. We know it's Mary when we put it with the other accounts. We know her name's Mary. But John never calls Mary by name in his whole gospel. This book is book, this, the book of John is bookended with Mary. It's bookended with her. It begins with Mary being mentioned, the mother of Jesus. Remember, John had the responsibility of taking care of her after Jesus died. He begins the book by bringing up the mother of Jesus. He ends the book by bringing up Mary, the mother of Jesus. How? Because Jesus entrusts him with his mother. She bookends the book. She's never mentioned by name specifically, but we know it's her. She's the mother of Jesus. And she clearly knows about his power, doesn't she? Why would she come to him with the problem? Why would she come to Jesus? Would she want him to go out and do a wine run real quick? She knew he could do it. She's familiar with his power. She's already familiar with it. She knows what he can do. She knows what he can do to save this family from social disgrace. I've seen her in service. Yes. And that's the next thing I want to say. Notice she says, she tells the servants in verse 5, what does she say? Whatever he says, what? Do it. What's your, what, what's your impression about that statement? She understood his authority. Yes. Yes. She, she understands his authority. And, and can I even add to that, Lance, by saying this? She understands there's more to their relationship. That's his mama, right? But is that just his mama? Is that just their relationship, mother, son, or is there more to their relationship? Lord. That's her Lord. That's her Lord. So that's something we, for, we forget so often. And I know that can seem kind of weird, but that's her son. That's absolutely right. But he has authority over her, too, in a sense, in a big sense. He's the Lord also. And she, you see this hint of she, her understanding of this, like Doug said, when she said to the, ser, the head waiters, or to the servants, I'm sorry, whatever he says, you do it. You do it. Isn't that how we should always have that kind of mentality? Whatever Jesus says, do it. That's what we should be telling people also. Do what he says. I like that. I like that from Mary. She understands the authority of Jesus. She understands there's more to their relationship. Now, let's get to this next part. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, please, go ahead. So the other Gospels, when the events surrounding Jesus when he's younger, it says that Mary remembered those things and kept her in her heart. She pondered them. And in Luke, when it talks about when he's 12 years old, it says he grew in statue with God and with man. But it also says he stayed, he was under subjection. Right. Yes, that's a good point. Taking care of Mary, and what's implied to me here is he has been preparing his mom to go with him on his ministry to help him out and the other women, apparently, so that they're like support staff. 
Right. No, that's a good point. Good point. Okay, so let's go to this next part. She comes to Jesus. She brings this problem to him. He's a guest like everybody else. How does he respond to it? Let's put it in our language. What does it got to do with me? That's exactly how he responds. He says, look at what he says. Um, verse 4, what does this have to do with us? And he doesn't just say that. He says something else. My hour hasn't come. Let me say some things about this. Jesus clearly doesn't want to get involved in this. He doesn't. He says, what does this have to do with us? He doesn't want to get involved in this. Now, when he says woman, I do not recommend any husbands go home and talk to your wife like that unless you want to spend Christmas or the holidays alone. I mean, it ain't going to go well, all right? And I definitely don't recommend you talk to your mama like that because that really won't go well. So in these times, the way from what I have studied on this, the, word, the way the word woman is used here is not how we would use it in our time in a very kind of degrading, condescending way. This was kind of similar from what I read on this to kind of respect for a man. Uh, I don't think this needs to be taken as Jesus is being disrespectful to his mother. I think the, word, the, the way the word woman is being used here is very different cultural-wise than how we use it today. But that's not really the main thing to focus on here. The main thing to focus on here is when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. What hour? What is he talking about? His manifestation and really the clock beginning to tick down on his, on his life. You see, Jesus knew something. He knew that as soon as he manifested himself to Israel, the clock was going to start ticking. That makes sense. As soon as he manifests himself and his miracles will start becoming well known, guess what's going to happen? Things are going to get hostile for him. The Jewish leaders are going to be on him. They're going to feel threatened and intimidated by him because his popularity is going to increase and grow. Jesus knew that as soon as he started doing miracles, manifesting his glory to Israel, the clock was going to start winding down. From this, I think we can conclude that Jesus had authority from the Father to choose the time and the place to begin manifesting himself. He had that authority. He didn't intend to do this when he got there. My hour hasn't come yet, but he's going to do it. And when he does it, the scripture says in verse 11, this was the beginning of his signs when he starts manifesting his glory. From this point on, the clock's going to start ticking. It's going to start ticking. That's the idea. Now, let's talk about the miracle. The purpose of this miracle was to manifest the glory of Jesus. The miracle involved two things, transformation and superiority. Transformation and superiority. Jesus will transform one substance to another substance. He will transform water into wine. And when the Bible uses the word wine, it's just referring to the fruit of the vine, grape juice. Okay? And you have to study the context often to figure out if it's fermented or unfermented. Most of the time it is unfermented. But I'll get to that in just a second. So Jesus transform, transforms water into wine. And what he transforms is superior. It is better wine. It is better than the wine that's already been served. And that's not the way they did it. Usually, when do they serve the best wine? At the beginning. But on this occasion, the best wine, the superior wine, will come later. So he transforms one substance to another. And what he transforms is superior. Now, you got six stone water pots. These are massive. What Jesus does here would have been more than enough to keep the party going. It would have been more than enough. These are massive containers. Okay? And I want to say this. I just want to say this. I think it is a shame that we go here so often as Christians today and we focus on the wrong stuff. We just focus on the wrong stuff. So often, and many of y'all know this, 
We go to John 2 and we have a discussion about fermented wine, unfermented wine, unfermented wine. We talk about drinking. We talk about alcohol. And we just totally miss the point. Don't get me wrong. Drinking is wrong. It's wrong. If you don't believe that, go spend some time reading Proverbs. Okay? There are numerous passages to have that discussion. Numerous passages. Old Testament, New Testament. We can have those discussions. We just make a mistake having it here. We, have a, we make a mistake. Look, Jesus is not contributing to people getting drunk at a party. Is that the son of God, kind of son of God you think he is? Come on. He's not contributing to people getting drunk at a party. That's not Jesus. He's pure. He's holy. We know Jesus is not doing that. We know that. But that's not even worthy of a discussion here because the point of this is Jesus does a miracle. That's the point. He does a miracle. He transforms one substance to another substance. He does it just like that. And when he does it, what he makes is better. It is better than what was before. That's the point. This is a miracle. Have you ever seen anything like that in your life? You ever seen that? You ever seen somebody turn Coke to Pepsi just like that? Come on. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so Jesus performs a miracle. That's the point. That's the point here. Now, why this miracle? Why this miracle? I need to say some things about this. Let me give you three things to think about, and we can have a discussion, Okay. Why this miracle? Well, first, the location, I think, is a big deal. This is in Cana of Galilee. I don't know if you know this. Maybe you've heard me say this before. But 70 percent, about 70 percent of Jesus' ministry takes place in Galilee. Okay? Galilee's a very small area. It's in Israel. It's Capernaum, Bethsaida, uh, Nazareth. Much of Jesus' ministry will take place in Galilee, particularly around this little body of water called the Sea of Galilee. So this, where Jesus begins his miracles, is exactly where he's going to do most of his miracles. The word of mouth concerning Jesus will begin. The word about him is going to get out to thousands and thousands of people, and this is during an age without any kind of social media. So, it, so the location is important, but then the opportunity, the secondly, the opportunity presented here, the opportunity to begin to really convict his apostles. Remember, he told Nathaniel, you will see things greater than these. Well, how appropriate it is for him to start fulfilling that promise in Nathaniel's hometown, in Cana of Galilee. This is a great opportunity for Jesus to begin to manifest himself to the people he's going to be interacting with mostly, which are the people of Galilee and his apostles, his disciples. But then there's the messianic overtones. And this is where it gets a little complicated. OK, you have the messianic overtones that are mentioned here. Now I'm going to throw some stuff on the slide and I'm sorry I won't get to go into a lot of details on this. I like I told you, I studied this for several hours a few months ago. I had to present this to some brethren during a Zoom study uh, back in, in, in Tennessee. So I have to spend a little bit more time talking about it with them, but I'm just going to put it in a nutshell on, on, the, on the screen for you here. The prophets, the prophets, Isaiah, um, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, they often use banquets, wine, and bridegrooms to talk about the coming of the Messiah. Have you noticed that when you studied your Old Testament? Have you noticed how often the prophets talk about banquets? They talk about wine. They talk about feasting. They talk about bridegrooms and usually they use this language to talk about the time of the Messiah. They do that often. Wine specifically, fruit of the vine, is often used as symbolism for success and blessing. Now, those, there's some scripture references here for you to write down, okay? Write these things down. There's, these are just three uh, verses or three samplings here of many. And these passages here, when you read them, you will read prophecies being made about the Messiah. Prophecies being made about Jesus, and wine is being used to talk about his coming. It's being used to talk about 
blessing, spiritual success. The, the prophets use this language constantly. Genesis 49 is the occasion, if you remember, when Jacob gathered his sons around uh, his, his deathbed. You know, he's dying, and he blesses them. He starts prophesying over all of them. And Judah is singled out as the one his tribe would bring the Messiah into the world. And, and Jacob uses wine as symbolism for success and blessings in the time of the Messiah. Isaiah uses that language several times in his book. One example is Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. Amos, at the end of the book of Amos, he uses the same language to talk about the blessings of the Messiah. Isaiah 9, 11 through 13. Now here's the reason why that, that is important. As Jesus attends this wedding, I want you to think carefully with me here, okay? As Jesus attends this wedding, and as John pens these words, as he pens these words, it is likely that they anticipated the Jews seeing this connection. It is likely that Jesus picked this opportunity because he knew the Jews would be familiar with banquets and weddings and wine, and they would be able to see that connection when he does a miracle and tie that to him being the Messiah. That is very likely why the scripture clearly says that after Jesus did this, the disciples believed. Their familiarity with the prophets would have helped them see the connection between Jesus and, and, and being at a wedding <laughs> where there's a bridegroom and you got wine and feasting taking place and he performs a miracle. The prophets foretold a day when the Messiah would usher in wine and feasting. That language, wine and feasting, there again, is a reference to blessings, spiritual abundance. The prophets often use wine and feasting as symbolic language or figurative language to talk about the reign of the Messiah. He would bring spiritual prosperity when he came and did his work. Now, I know that's kind of deep there, but I think that is exactly what is going on here. Jesus attends a wedding. The, the prophets often spoke of weddings and connected them to the Messiah. Jesus turns water into wine. The prophets often connected wine to the Messiah. Jesus uh, is there with a bridegroom. Well, who's the ultimate bridegroom according to the Bible? Jesus is. Who's the bride? We're the, we're the bride. The New Testament, Paul makes this point in Ephesians chapter 5. There's just so many messianic overtones to be seen here in John 2. It's just deep. And, and, and I think Jesus is clearly, I mean, he's a son of God. He's familiar with the, with the words of the prophets, and the Jews would have been. The Jews would have been able to make these connections. And I think that contributed to a lot of people starting to believe in him and the clock beginning to tick down on his redemptive, on him going to the cross for his redemptive work. So I just want to say that for you, okay? One more thing I need to say to you. Lessons we can learn about Jesus here. I want to just give you three things, and then, and then that's, going to be my, that's all I'm going to have to say. I want you to think of three things here when it comes to Jesus. First here, I think we see Jesus' power and ability, ability to transform. He has the power to transform. He transforms water into wine, doesn't he? He transforms one substance to another substance. But not only does he transform water into wine, you know what else he does? He transforms people. He changes people. He changed me. He changed you. He changed the Corinthians, didn't he? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. They were homosexuals at one time. Some of them adulterers, fornicators, idolaters. But Paul says they were washed, sanctified, justified, changed by Jesus. Jesus is in the ability of changing things. He changes water into wine. He continues to change people through his gospel today. A second thing we see is the superiority of Jesus. Just like Jesus' wine was superior on this occasion, everything he offers is superior. His covenant is superior, right? His sacrifice is superior. His priesthood is superior. That sounds like the book of Hebrews, doesn't it? That's the book of Hebrews. Jesus does something that is superior to what had already been done, and that would foreshadow what he, what he would be about in every aspect. Covenant, sacrifice, priesthood, a home builder, spiritual house builder. He's superior in every way. We see that 
that, that idea jump starting right here in John 2. And then thirdly, as we said earlier, Jesus is the bridegroom. He's the bridegroom. I mean, he, he attends a wedding here and there's a bridegroom here and, you know, he, he's saved from social disgrace by Jesus. You know, the, the servants say, hey, well, this wine is totally better, it's much better. <laughs> there's a bridegroom here, but that only foreshadowed what Jesus would be, which is the ultimate bridegroom. He's the bridegroom. We're the bride, the church. And we want to be a faithful bride to the bridegroom. So a lot more I could say about that. I just wanted to kind of just show you just the layers, the onion here. There's an onion, so many layers going on here with the work of Jesus. And that's what you find throughout the Gospels. We're going to have a good study, I believe, on the miracles of Jesus. I'm excited about it. And I hope this right here will kind of just, you know, wet your mouth a little bit and help you be excited, anticipate so many wonderful things we're going to see as we study the miracles of Jesus. Okay, we got a few minutes left. Let's open it up for comments. Brother Gary, go ahead, sir. Well, I, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. I think that could also be part of it. Um, in fact, that could have even been a big part of it. I would just say that this, when the people saw this miracle and if they understood the prophets, they would have been thinking more and seeing the connection. Because anytime Jesus did a miracle, and I think we can agree on this, it always was tied to his identity. It never was just to be nice to people. You know what I'm saying? It always was tied to, I'm trying to demonstrate something of who I am. And so I think, you know, the, I think Mary is definitely tied to it. And, I, and I'm still puzzled even, you know, the language of why my hour is not yet come yet, he still does it, but that's another thing. But I still think probably at the core of this is he wants to manifest himself to Israel. And I think he would have known, and the Jews would have been able to see these connections with their familiarity with the prophets. But I, don't, I, I do not think it's wrong at all, Brother Gary, to say his mother didn't have a big part. And maybe this is some providential going on here. His mother didn't have a big part in, in kind of nudging him to go ahead and begin the manifestation. So that's a good point, though, and I don't disagree. Brother Dale, yes, sir. Oh, and, I, and, and that's the point. You actually said it better than I did. That's the point I really was trying to make with this particular setting of being at this wedding. You know, I really didn't come here for this, but it does provide a great opportunity. And, and, and I think to me that that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Brother John, yes, sir. And then Don, I'll see you after that, sir. Even though the scripture doesn't specifically say it, John, it is there. It is there because he does a big favor for this family. I, I'm glad you really are seeing that because I really can't emphasize enough how bad this would have been if Jesus didn't step in for this family. This would have been a social disgrace. So th that's a great point. And, and like we studied Sunday, Jesus, miracles are often tied to compassion too. So that's a good point. Brother Don, then we get ready to close. He's been transforming things for a long time. Ain't that right, Don? That is God. <laughs> yes. He's demonstrating that he is God. He's God. Amen. Oh, that's good stuff. So thank you all so much. Um, I think we're going to have a good study. And again, be safe over the holidays. Continue to study your Bibles. On, on Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to look at Matthew 8 through 9. And we're not going to just look at one miracle, but we're going to look at an explosion of miracles. 
that takes place in those two chapters. So we'll get ready for that on the, on the Lord's Day. Thank you very much.